in you there will be a word deposited that will come alive on the inside of you and you're going to take it to the people that are around you and when it comes, see watch this, this word will come as a seed tonight in your life and when it comes as a seed when it grows up, it will produce fruit now please understand ladies and gentlemen the fruit is not about you it's not something for you to eat Yes, Catch that revelation. The fruit that God that this word brings forth is not for you. Watch this. Psalm 1 teaches us that our leaf shall not wither and will bear fruit in our season. The fruit is for the other people around us. You never see a tree eating its own fruit. No. You see the tree gleaning from the leaves and from the roots. Lord, the Bible said you will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth fruit in your season. That's what the word of God on the inside of you is going to do when it comes alive. It's going to come up. It's going to bring forth fruit in its season. When it's needed, it's going to bring fruit. Mm. And somebody who needs it in your life is going to produce. They're going to eat from the fruit that God has produced in you. Oh. Understand. So what is God going to give me? He's going to sustain me with the leaves and the root. Lord have mercy. That's why your roots have to go deep in God. That's why you see so many people are trying to go higher when God's trying to take you deeper. I need some folks that say, God, take me deeper. And please understand that going deeper is the stuff that people don't get to see. Everybody doesn't get to see when God takes you deeper. Everybody doesn't get to experience the depth of God in your life. That's the stuff that people don't see. And so many people are trying to be higher because that's the stuff that makes us look good. I'm not saying you got to be in a place where God, I need depth because watch this. When the storms come. There it is. Oh, I need some folk to talk right there. Because when the storms come, if you got good deep roots, you might bend, but you won't break. You might bend, but you won't go over. You'll be able to stand when the wind blows. That's what God is after. And watch this. I'm going to give you the rest of that piece on Psalm 1 and I'm going to preach my message. Because understand, ladies and gentlemen, watch this. It says your leaf won't wither. That's right. Good. I'll be able to continually feast from the word of God that has sprung forth in my life. You'll be able to continually eat from that word. It'll continually blossom and grow and grow more and grow more. Why? Because you let it stay in you and produce. He's made provision for you to eat. And he's made provision for others to eat from you. In case you haven't figured out, these last three nights, yes, sir. the last two nights, and tonight being the third, what God's purpose and his plan has been is to develop the saints and to build us to something powerful. The first night I preached about turning points and pivotal moments. Turning points talk to us about changing direction. Yes, sir. But the problem is it does us no good to change direction if we have not been converted. Go ahead. If on the inside we have not been changed. So now the pivotal moment is when we make the decision that I'm going to allow everything in me to be altered, to be shifted, to be changed. It means I'm going to be contorted. It means I'm going to be bent. It's going to, it means I'm going to be shaped. It means I'm going to be fashioned and it's going to be uncomfortable. I can't hear a talk back church right there. We don't like to talk about the discomfort that comes with the change of heart. Yes, sir. Because if you've always been going one direction and you've been comfortable in that direction, when God starts bending a thing in your life, bending your will, watch this, conforming your will to his, when your will begins to conform, it becomes uncomfortable and at times even painful. Yes, sir. So you can't be like Peter. After all the stuff that God has done, he said, no, he, he, he was told, Jesus, you go, Jesus says, I'm going to die and I'm going to get back up. After all that, he saw him get back up. Saw him after he rose. Oh, no. He still said, I'm going back to my boat. My challenge to everyone in this room is you can't afford to go back to your boat. Whatever your boat is, it doesn't necessarily mean sin. It could simply be a comfort zone. You can't afford to go back to your boat. 
It's what, you, what you're familiar with. For Peter, it was the thing that made him comfortable. Because after all the failures of his life, he had just cut off a man's ear. He had denied the Lord three times. Y'all know Peter. He was impetuous. He was a hothead. And so he went back to his place of comfort where he could be successful. And God says, I'm not going to let you do that. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight. I don't even know why I had to go back there. But somebody needs to know, God's not going to allow you to go back to what is comfortable in your life after tonight. Amen. You won't be able to go back. He's going to do some adjustments in you. And he's going to cause you to make your own, make a conscious decision. What are you going to do after today? Go back to your boat. Yes, sir. Or be a fisher of men. Go back to your boat. Or do what I've called you to do. Mm -hmm. You got a choice. So you gotta consider all of this. Then last night we talked about your faith being built, and we talked about how God wants to work on you. Here again. It's his plan to work in your life until he gets it all out of you. Tonight, I'm left with the question, do I trust him? Thank you, man of God. Like I say, I do. Yes, sir. If I don't get all excited tonight, y'all just walk with me through the word of God. I got to make sure I leave a deposit in this room. This deposit is so vital and so important that I need you to get it. Rather than getting emotional, I need you to get the truth of the word of God like never before in your heart. Because one of the ways that God works his plan in our lives is directing us through a journey that doesn't make sense. I don't know if I'm talking to anybody in here who may be. I'll just talk about myself. God has taken me on a journey that did not make sense. He has at times flipped my life completely upside down just to get his will out of me. He told me about three and a half years ago. I was planning after the passing of my father, I had planned to move to Atlanta, Georgia. Went through a major life change here. Not that I had to move, not that I was running from anything. It's what God said, I had to go. I'm like, okay, God, I've been in this place a long time. All my life I've lived in Jacksonville, Florida. And you wanna move me? So I thought Atlanta, Georgia was the place I was supposed to go. And at the very last minute, God said no. I was going to Atlanta. My plan was I wanted to go and heal. Because if you understand how close my father and I were before his passing, my dad and I were like this. So it ripped me apart. My family's sitting in this room, but they don't even know how badly it ripped me apart when my dad died. But understand, six months prior to that, my other friend passed away, being my grandmother. I was already reeling from that. I remember. I remember. But Thanksgiving after my grandmother passed away, I was standing in the kitchen and my uncle said, you're going to carve the turkey this year. And to somebody that might seem like, that's not much, that doesn't matter. But in many ways, it was a rite of passage. It was saying something, and, and, and most people wouldn't catch this, but it meant something had shifted in me. And I stood at the sink and I had to back up. Because when I was standing there, tears began to stream down my face because my grandmother wasn't going to be there so I could see her smile. This was the first Thanksgiving that I was without her. I was broken on the inside. Nobody really knew how the depth of that pain. Nobody knew. But I cried. I went back up because I didn't want to get tears on the turkey. <laughs> and I 
time to step back and carve some more. What are you saying, Lone? Six months prior to my father, my grandmother, I'm not even over that, and now here my dad gets leukemia. Looks like he's doing better, then all of a sudden they say he took a turn for the worse. January 15, 2013, he went home to be with the Lord. 3.45 in the morning, I remember trying to call my mama, tell them, call my aunt to tell them that dad had passed. I could barely talk. I was stuttering over words. I couldn't even get it out because I was so torn up. And then after all of that, not long after that, God says, and I, my plan was I was going to move to Atlanta, stay, stay up there so I could just take time to heal. I didn't want to be bothered with church folk. Amen. Huh, can I be honest tonight? I didn't want to be bothered with church folk. Church folk had gotten on my nerves. <laughs> because they couldn't understand my pain. They wanted to be religious. And you could just get through this. You'll be all right. No, some stuff you can't just shake like that. I wasn't grieving as a man who had no hope. I was just grieving. All right. It was hurting me. I said, I'm going to go and I'm going to go to Atlanta. I'm going to move and I'm going to be, I'm going to take time to heal. I'm not going to be anybody's preacher. I'm, whatever church I go to, I'm going to sit on the back row. Now, you got to understand, I've been credentialed for a whole lot of years. This, this past December made 22 years I've been in ministry. 22. I was ready to put it all down just so I could heal. Then God turns around and tells me, Long, you got to move to Knoxville, Tennessee. Huh? Uh, Lord. And so I had already made up my mind. I wasn't going to Knoxville. So all of a sudden, I'm up preaching one night. When I get done preaching, the power of God's moved in the place, so on and so forth. I'm in Knoxville. And all of a sudden, after the service is over, I'm in the back. I'm on the floor. This prophetess comes, and she's praying for me. Her and her husband are praying for me. She says, God said, Atlanta is not the place. I promise y'all, just stay with me. I'm going somewhere. He said, Atlanta's not the place. God said, I'm going to launch your ministry in Knoxville, Tennessee. I said, surely this lady is crazy. <laughs> a couple of months later, I was in Knoxville preaching again. And all of a sudden, I'm in the middle of preaching in high gear. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit sends me a download from heaven. It says, long, you're moving to Knoxville, and this is going to be your church home. Okay. So at that point, I finally said yes to God. Okay? Finally said yes. When I finally said yes to God, do y'all not know that he put me in that place because he was setting up something that I could not even imagine? I'm talking about the journey. Do you trust God like you say you do? Uh. See, because when I left to go to Knoxville, Tennessee, I had no car. When I left to go to Knoxville, Tennessee, I had nothing but my business materials, my computer, and my clothes. That's all I had. I didn't even know where I was completely going to stay. Matter of fact, can I just be real with y'all up in here? Can I really be just transparent? What most people don't know, although I did have places I could go stay, for nine months, I was without a home of my own. I want y'all to hear what I'm saying. Yes, I had places where I could go, you know, tentatively here or there, but I did not have a place of my own for nine whole months. In part, while I was on the road, and, and it was so amazing because in that time, God released me on the road more than I was had ever been before preaching. So I spent a whole lot of time in hotels. And then come back to not having anything. Oh, and get this, ladies and gentlemen, I had to preach on the road as if nothing was wrong with me. For nine straight months, I was preaching, and I could not let it be known that I didn't have a place of my own to go back to. I was preaching, even though I was in the hell of my life, I could not let it show. I had to just go through it. Where God was taking me did not make any sense at all. 
said, surely this cannot be God. God said, yes, it is. I'm the kind of God that will take you through some processes that don't make sense to you, that are uncomfortable to you, that even hurt you at times, because I got to get you into the place of my will. I got to get you to the place where you're needed the most. I got to maneuver your life because somebody needs you in a place. I don't know who I'm preaching to tonight, but I'm trying to tell somebody that this process that you have been in has been the hand of God directing and orchestrating your life, building you and perfecting you to put you right where he wants you, at the time where he wants you, even when it did not make sense. Mm. Uh, I know this is for somebody tonight. He's doing this because and, and see he's listen can I get you can I get you to understand he's not going to ask your permission to do what he wants to do in your life see we've always heard folks say the Holy Spirit is a gentleman some of us he got us down to the altar and we told him yes Lord and when we said yes Lord something about that yes Lord was when we gave him the permission to have his way in our life when we said yes Lord sometimes it felt like we inebriated. It felt like we were drugged up. We were high. And we said yes, Lord. But what you didn't understand was when you said yes, you gave him permission to do whatever he wants to do. You said my life is not my own. Oh, oh, oh. I, I don't know. Anybody else in here said that? My life is not my own. You can have all of me, God. And when he starts doing exactly that, you say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How in the world do you do this to me? You'll fix it so it doesn't make sense. You'll fix it. Then after I said yes, see, we love singing that song, yes, yes, yes. We don't realize what we're saying when we say that. We sing it because it sounds good. We sing it because it's good and churchy. But every time you open up your mouth from this time on, even forevermore, when you say yes, you better think about what you're saying. Because when you say yes, you're giving God permission to take you through another dimension. You're giving God permission to take you to another level. You're giving God permission to walk you through hell. I wish I had a talk back church right there. You are literally giving God permission to walk you through hell. See, the people don't see we got this Q church now. Q church says God will not take you through anything. Oh uh, no, the Bible says he's not gonna tempt you above allow you to be tempted above that which you are able to bear. But with the temptation, he's gonna make a way of escape. But sometimes he's gotta walk you. Oh, can I talk the Bible? Psalm 23 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death I will fear no evil wait a minute why because thou art surely I can't be walking through the valley of the shadow of death and he's not with me but the Bible said he is with me so obviously if I'm walking through the valley and the shadow of death and it says he's with me even this rough place is a, it's God I wish I had somebody right there that can understand there can be no mountaintop until this valley. There can be no mountaintop until there's valley. I need to find the people in here that learn what it means to celebrate that you've been through the valley. Even if you're in the valley right now, can you celebrate that he's the God that knows how to walk you through the valley? He's the God that knows how to push you even in your valley. He's the God that knows how to perfect you in the valley. You won't, you won't be able to handle, you won't be able to handle your mountaintop until you've mastered your valley. You can't, see in the valley you can't see a whole lot. In the valley things are hidden from
from you. In the valley, your vision is limited, but you got to learn how to master it when you can't see a whole lot, when there's not a lot around you, nothing but snakes. Dangerous animals are in the valley. Y'all not talking to me up in here. When you're in the valley, there's all kind of dangerous animals. But I come to tell you, you got a master handling the dangerous animals. He's going to let you walk through serpents and scorpions. And they will not by any means bring harm to you. you got to learn how to trust him in the valley. You can't find him to be a mountaintop God until you've learned what it means to trust him in the valley. Do you trust him? Yes. The way you say you do. Oh God. You can't. See, everybody wants the mountaintop God. Yes, sir. Can I preach like I feel like preaching? Everybody wants the fire and smoke God. Y'all remember Moses, right? When they look at the people of God, look up at the mountain, they saw all this stuff. They saw the fire, they saw the smoke, they saw the lightning, and they were afraid. Everybody wants the fire, they want the smoke, they want the lightning, but nobody wants the valley. Mm. But do you not understand, some of my greatest revelation came in the valley. I didn't learn how to pray until I had been pressed. Can't hear nobody right there. I didn't really learn how to pray until I had been pressed a while. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Ah, Job said it like this, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Lord have mercy. I got to be tried. That means I got to be put in the crucible. I got to be put in the heat. I got to be put in the fire. I got to have the heat turned up because there's some stuff in me that needs to get out of me. And I got to get it before I go to the mountaintop. Yes. I'm almost there. You gotta understand, ladies and gentlemen. God is navigating your life on purpose to get you somewhere. And He's doing it because He has to get you ready. See, you can't get greater vision to your master valley. Yes, yes. Can I help somebody right here? In that process, I know. The Bible talks about how we got to speak to mountains and tell mountains to be removed and all that stuff. I get it. But sometimes when it comes to seeking after God, that's what you call the mountaintop experience. Mm -hmm. Hello. I'm not talking about the mountaintop of trials. I'm not talking about the mountaintop of troubles. When you, when you deal with that stuff, you got to learn how to speak to it. But when it comes to the mountaintop of experiencing God, there's a place where you got to climb. Yes, sir. Y'all not talking. That, oh, yes, yes, yes. I got to help somebody right there. Because you got to put in effort to make the climb to the mountaintop. Oh, I hear the Holy Ghost. What happens is you hear the call of God saying, come up higher. There's some people sitting in here right now. You have heard the call of God say, come up higher. I come to tell you, no matter who lays hands on you, no matter how they oil you up, you can have more oil on you than a pig in a county fair. You're not going to go higher until you make the decision that I'm going to climb the mountain to pursue the nature and the will of God. I got to seek his face. I got to make the effort to do it. My God. It's not just going to come. You got to labor. You got to labor. Sometimes see, I can go back to Exodus. When Moses went up, the Bible said around chapter 32, 33, that Moses went up to meet with God early in the morning. And when he went up, y'all don't think that there were pathways up the mountain, do you? Y'all not talking. Y'all don't think that there were pathways, easy paths up the mountain. He had to climb that mountain. He had to work his way up that mountain. He didn't have climbing gloves. Y'all not talking. He didn't have climbing materials. It meant he had to trust God all the way up. Because if I look back, if I'm not careful, my foot can slip. But because it got shot, because God has ordained for you to go higher, he's got a word up under you that will not allow you to slip while you're in the climb to ascend into his presence. He's going to hold you up by the word of his mouth. I'm not going to slip because I got to climb because I heard a word. I don't 
Oh, am I talking to anybody in here that has heard the voice of God say it's time for you to go up? You've been in this place long enough. You can't stay here any longer. It's time for you to come up higher. It's time to come beyond where you've been. Yes, sir. My God. Moses had to climb up that mountain to get where he had to go. And when he got there, God said, I can't show you my face, but I'm going to show you my hinder parts. He said, Lord, I just want you to show me your glory. Yes, I don't care. Go ahead, preach. I don't know about anybody else, but if I can't have anything else, God, show me your glory. Can I get about three people that really in your heart, that's what you really want. Because when you see the glory of God, it is transformative. It doesn't let you just be churchy anymore. When you see the glory of God, it doesn't let you be the same person you were. When you see the glory of God, when you experience his presence, it changes you forever. The Bible said that when Moses experienced that place in God, when he came down from the mountain, his face was lit up. They had to cover it up because they couldn't take it. I'm looking for the day when the saints of God have been so in the presence of God that when we come around folks, they say there's something about you. You're all lit up. They can't stand to be around you. They say, wait a minute, you got to back up because there's something on your face. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Anybody want that glory? Anybody want that glory? Uh, I want that. I want that. I want that. I want that. Oh God. Can you imagine the scars that were on his hand from the climb? Could you imagine what kind of blood was coming out of his hands from the climb? Yes, sir. But he was so determined. But he was so determined. I got to get up there where God is. Because I'm going to find something new that I've not seen about him ever before. That's where I want to be. And I'm asking, is there a church who wants that in your life tonight? Because God is setting the stage for something great. And you've got to understand that the fact that you are here and that you are alive right now is because God wants you a part of this act right here. Y'all know stage production. He wants you to be a part of this act. You couldn't come on the scene before now. He had to put you on the scene right now. Why did he put you on the scene right now? He put you there because your purpose and what he designed you to be falls right into the tapestry of this moment right here that you're living in. I don't know who I'm talking to, but you got to make the most of this moment that you're in. I'm not preaching to you about getting purpose and destiny. I'm preaching to you about finding Christ in you. The hope of glory. I'm preaching to you about developing the nature of Christ. So everybody you come in contact with, they find Christ. They experience his glory. They experience his presence. They experience his power. I'm trying to get you to get there. How bad do you want it? How Bad. Do you want it? I feel something shifting in here. How bad do you want it? Do you want it bad enough to wake up at two or three o'clock in the morning when he shifts you? Do you want it bad enough to get up and start walking the floor and begin to pray? Do you want it bad enough to get up and start walking the floor and crying out to him? Do you want it bad enough that, oh, wait a minute, when it seems like he's not even answering you, you keep crying out anyway? None of y'all ever been there. When you're talking to God, you're having conversation, and it seems like, God, there's nothing happening. When you're talking to God, it seems like he's not answering you. Anybody ever been there? Seems like the heavens were as brass. That's the moment when you got to learn to trust him like you say you do. You say you trust God. Why are you going through hell and high water? But the truth of the matter is, what do you do when he's not speaking back to you in that moment? Can you endure? Do you trust him? 
like you say you do. Do you really trust him when it seems like everything is against you? So let me let me go on around third base. I, I got so much more I could put in there, but I'm just gonna leave it alone. I, do you understand that God wants us to learn to trust him? Because watch this. The scripture said it like this. He said, You put a new song in my mouth. That's it. Even Matter of fact, it starts before that. It says, he picked me up and pulled me out of the miry clay. Yes, now, when you understand the reference of that, it was when they were making bricks. Yes, <laughs> it was when they were making bricks. They were working drudgingly and making those bricks to build something. But God said, and the Bible said, he picked me up out of the miry clay. When I was trying, oh Lord Jesus. The Bible said, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So I've been building, I've been working, I've been bricklaying. But today, God says, I'm snatching you out of your miry clay. I'm snatching you out of the dark place. I'm snatching you out of the muddy place. When you're up to your knees and you feel like you can't move, I'm picking you up and I'm snatching you out. But you gotta learn to trust me while you're still in it. But then, here's what I want to get to. It then says, after he did that, he gave me feet, like hind feet. That's it. So I can walk on my high places. Woo! He shifted. God have mercy. He shifted my nature. I can't hear nobody. He shifted my nature. He shifted my nature. I don't have human feet, if you will. I got hinds feet. Hinds feet are the kind of feet that they know how to jump from one rock crevice to another. They jump as they go higher and they can maneuver in and out without a prop. God have mercy. I feel it in here tonight that God is raising up a people who will know how to move higher and maneuver in the mountain of God. You'll know when it's time to worship. You'll know when it's time to pray. You'll know when it's time to pray. You'll know when it's time to sit still. You'll just know it in your heart. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. He says, I'm raising up that kind of people. And so you'll be able to navigate in the spirit and go where you need to go. Feet like hind feet. Somebody say, I'm getting feet like hind feet. Y'all don't sound too convinced to me. I said, say, you got to declare, I'm getting feet like hind feet. Oh God. I'm getting ready to navigate through the mountain of God. I'm getting ready to navigate as he directs me. I'm getting ready to move in the way he directs. Oh God, I don't want to just do it in my own accord, but I want to do it as he guides me. As I hear his voice, I want to do it as he leads me. I want his voice to be the thing that guides my heart. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So, give me feet. Like high feet. I walk on my high places. He said he put a new song in my mouth. Even a praise unto my God. When God begins to shift your nature, it'll cause a new praise to come out of you. When you've been in the valley and you start to experience the change of crossing over into the mountaintop and navigating the mountaintop, it creates a new praise in you that you've not had before. And this is why God has to do it. Because watch this. He says he put a new praise in my mouth. Oh, even a praise unto my God. Watch this. And it says, and many will see and hear and put their trust in the Lord because of what God is doing. If you learn how to trust him when you can't trace him, you'll find that you're Oh God, you become the catalyst for the blessing of other people. They're going to see. They're going to hear. They're going to hear you. Oh, not the sheep bleeding up on the Not bleeding, B-L-E-E-D, but bleeding, making a sound on the top of the mountain. They're going to hear you up there. They're going to hear your song change because you see things differently. I can see clearly now. The rain is caught. Ah, oh, they're going to hear you singing your song. They're going to look up there. Oh God, I feel like preaching. They're going to look up there. They're going to see they're gonna hear it and because of that they're gonna put their trust in the Lord do I have
have Bible to back me up? Sure I do. Come on to Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas in a Roman jail. They're down in the deepest place of the jail. And the Bible said they were chained to a wall. But it didn't stop them. It might have looked like they were in the valley. But in the spirit, they were in the mountaintop. They saw something that they had never seen before. They began to worship. And when they worship, and when they prayed, good God Almighty, something happened in that place. Calm down, Long, because I need you to hear this. Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. Did you understand? Now, this is just a parenthetical insertion. I need you to hear this real good. What do you do when you do what you're supposed to do in the moment and God doesn't answer in the way you expect? Go ahead. Oh, Lord. See, most people don't pay attention to this in the text. This is what, this is what, this is what, mess, this is what messed me up, y'all. Watch this. When they were praying... And they were singing. We really don't have evidence of what exactly they were praying for or what they were singing. But we just know they were praying and they were singing. But the answer to, to their prayer was not God just loosen the chains. Y'all missed it. The answer to their prayer and to their song, Dee Dee, wasn't the chains falling off. The answer to their prayer was an earthquake. Yes, sir. That was it. I preached the message one time and I said, it's your fault. Because you cried out to God, that's why the earth is shaking around you. Because the book of Hebrews says, I will shake the things that can be Jesus. He said, I will shake the things that can be shaken so the stuff that cannot be shaken will remain. I'm trying to tell you tonight that if you're in a place where you've been praying, you've been fasting, you've been seeking the Lord, you've been singing, you've been worshiping, and things have been shaking, perhaps it's because he's bringing an earthquake rather than just breaking the chain. You messed up when you said that one right there. God has a way of creating disturbance. When, have you been praying hard enough? Have you been praying with enough faith that it's causing God to answer with disturbance? Wow. Mm. My God. My God. Can, can I drop some more on you? Y'all do remember the Red Sea, don't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> Bible said that the children of Israel began to complain because they had mountains on the left, mountains on the right, had Pharaoh's army behind them, and that big old Red Sea in front of them. And the Bible declares that when they prayed and they cried, and Moses went to God and said, God, what am I supposed to do? God said, what's in your hand? And he said, the rock. God said, stretch out your hand. Well, wait a minute. Here's where the shout is. Moses stretched out his hand, and when Moses stretched his hand out, the Bible said a strong wind came and blew it. You don't think the wind just blew over the water? Do you? <laughs> what do you do when you're in a place of devastation? You're scared because you're blocked in and God doesn't answer you with just opening the way. He makes you stretch out and when you stretch out, God have mercy. He answers with a storm. Yes. Oh my, my God. God. My God. You're working. You're working. <laughs> One of the hardest places to be, mama, is when God answers by a storm. Yes, sir. Yes. Jesus. But I heard the old saints used to sing a song, so he rides on the windstorm. That's the way he's going to open your Red Sea. He's going to ride on the windstorm. Somebody ought to praise him because he's coming right near on a windstorm. If you're in the middle of a windstorm right now, you just got to go ahead and praise him because he's opening your way of victory. He's opening your way of deliverance. He's opening your way of freedom. Come on through, sir. Preach. You're about to see answers you've never seen before. Uh, oh, I don't know why all this is coming out of me like this tonight, but somebody needs this. And let me just tell you, not too long ago I preached a message entitled, I refuse to live with a withered hand. If you're going to get victory, you can't walk around with a withered hand because you're going to need that hand. The Bible says it like this. He teaches my hands to the Lord. Have mercy. Y'all didn't hear what I said. He teaches my hands to war. So if he's teaching my hands to war, I need both of my hands to be working. I need both of my hands to be functional. I need both of my I can't have a withered hand. So I refuse to live with a withered hand. And so how did Moses get delivered? He had to stretch out his hand. If you're in here right now and you're living with a place of a withered hand, maybe you've been broken. Maybe you've been wounded. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe somebody dropped you. Maybe somebody 
somebody let you down. I don't know what you are, but you may be withered in some area of your life. You've got to decide tonight. I refuse to live another day with a withered hand. I won't be withered another day of my life. I'm getting ready to stretch out. Do me a favor and encourage somebody. I'm about to close this thing. Do me a favor and encourage somebody and tell them it's about time for you to stretch out. Tell somebody else, I'm getting ready to stretch out. I've been held up long enough. I'm getting ready to stretch out. I feel something bigger about to happen to me. I'm getting ready to stretch out. My deliverance is in my stretch. Somebody just do you do me a favor and stretch out right now. As an act of faith, stretch out right now. Oh, I hear the whole thing say, Father, I stretch shut my hands to thee. No other help I know. If I, I thank God for my Baptist roots. I'm a Pentecostal boy now. But I thank God for my Baptist roots. But they taught me if thou would draw thyself from me. Oh, well. Shall I go? Oh, I stretch, I stretch, I stretch, I stretch. I go past my previous limitations and I stretch. I don't have mercy. I need some people to stretch. Yes, sir. Give me just a couple more minutes. I'm gonna be done. Listen. Yes, sir. Listen, ladies and gentlemen. Where I am in the spirit tonight, I need you to grab this because now I got to go back to Abraham and close it. Yeah. What blesses my heart about Abraham is that the Bible said God spoke to him and told him, leave your family. That's it. That's it. That's what he said to me when I had to get make my change up to Tennessee. He said, you're going to have to leave your family. When I got to Tennessee, I didn't have any family up there. I had nobody I could call on. Yeah, I had my church family, but it's not the same as when you got your actual family there. When Christmas time comes and you want to be around your family and there's nobody there. Yeah, it's okay to go around their family, but it's not the same as being with yours. But I had to leave my family. Had to leave my kindred and my acquaintances because God had a plan and God had a purpose in my life. He had to shift me to a place I could not imagine. He had to put me there by myself. There's somebody in here tonight. You're in a place all by yourself. You might have people around you, but you feel like you're by yourself. But I come to tell you, you're in the perfect place. You're in the right place. I got to go, y'all. You're in the right place at the right time. And I come to tell you that if you're in the right place at the right time, can I close this thing now? The Bible said that Abraham, he decided whatever God... Now, wait, 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 before I go there. This is why I got to shout right here. Because his family, now I ain't talking about mine, but his family, they were idolatrous people. Right. The land of us was an idolatrous people. Ur of the Chaldeans worship idols. So he had no real frame of reference of this God that was talking to him. God have mercy. He didn't have a frame of reference of this God that was talking to him. But yet something about that God registered down in his belly that he was trustworthy. And Abraham walked out by faith. At the time, his name was Abram. But God decided down the road, I'm going to change your name to Abraham. Lord, I feel like preaching. I come to tell you that he left his family and his acquaintances. The Bible said his daddy's name was Terah. Terror means delay. If you're going to go somewhere, you got to leave your delay behind. No more procrastination. No more being held up. If you're going to get it, you got to leave delay behind. Ah, the place where he was. He was there in this place that was named Crossroads. you got to make a decision. I'm not staying at the crossroads anymore. Y'all better talk to me up in here. I'm talking to some people that say, God, I don't want to be at the crossroads anymore. I got to go somewhere. And this place where I am, I've been here long enough. And God said, go where I tell you to go. Move where I tell you to move. And I'm so glad. I'm so glad that God knows how to direct my steps. He directed Abraham all the way through. Abraham called himself trying to handle things. He lied to the king, told the king that Sarah was his sister, and 
and not his wife. He was trying to protect himself. But I come to tell you, when you're walking through this thing, God promised, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. And because he's got a plan for you, and because he's got a purpose for you, he's not going to drop you. He's not going to let you down. Here's the word. Stop working for both of them, but it 
time he breathed breath back into it. He breathed life into this. I come to tell you tonight, and I'm not trying to be vulgar, but when God put life back in them, they had to go home and work that thing. What God put in you, you got to work that thing. What God decided, you got to work that thing. Isaac wasn't coming until they worked that thing. I'm not trying to be crass, but you got to understand they had to go home and do something with what God gave them. Touch your neighbor and say, oh neighbor, you got to do something with what God gave you. Can I preach a little while longer? I come to tell you that when they got it, they came together. The Bible does not tell us how many times it took of them being husband and wife for Isaac to come. It doesn't tell us that it happened on the first time. If it doesn't happen on the first time, keep on working. If it doesn't happen on the second time, keep on working. If it doesn't happen on the third time, keep on working. However long it's going to take, keep on working. it. Grab somebody for the final time and say, keep on working. it. Like you say you do In the down times In the good times In the low times In the high times Do you trust him? Yeah! Yeah! How do I know That I trust him? Lord have mercy I know that I trust him When I can praise him When I don't see it When I can praise him When it doesn't look like it Somebody! Somebody!